Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Scott said, my name is Elizabeth Rood. There we go. Uh, and I am both the Director of Education and the Director for the Center for Childhood Creativity here at the Bay Area Discovery Museum, which means that I oversee all of our education and also all of our research. Part of what's so exciting to me about being part of this TED is that for us as an institution, creativity is at the core of who we are and what we want to be bringing out into the world. It is also for me as a mom and as a former teacher, a key piece that I think is missing oftentimes in our education systems. We have here on site a research center that is the only center in the entire country focused specifically on children's creativity development. We also here at the museum focus our programming on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And for us, what we want to be doing is helping the public and helping children see the enormous power of seeing their ideas and their problem solving come to life when they take creativity and they couple it together with STEM-based problems. For some people, the idea of STEM and creativity being married together seems maybe contradictory or at odds. I mean, how many of us sat in high school math and science classes where our job was to memorize and to parrot back a whole bunch of information that we had no sense how it applied in the real world, and we certainly were not asked to do anything particularly creative or interesting with it? And yet, if you think about the world around us and you think about the biggest problems that our community faces, we see that STEM and creativity are the recipe together for those solutions. Whether it is addressing climate change or eradicating diseases like Zika, or thinking about what in the world are we going to do with trash for a population that is growing by seven billion, I'm sorry, by a billion people in a decade. In all of these examples, it is STEM and creativity together that is the solution. In California, we know that STEM fields are growing rapidly. Of course, part of this is about the boom of technology, but it's also because of the need for STEM in our world to solve these great problems. I'm not here to tell you that every single one of our children is going to become a STEM professional or an engineer, but every single one of us in this room has an obligation and a duty to make sure that our kids' early learning experiences set them up for the brain development that is going to allow them to move into those fields if they so choose. And yet, in our elementary classrooms today, science is woefully lacking in our curriculum, which is why museums play, play a critical role in our community, making sure that kids get the holistic experiences that they need for success in the 21st century. I was a former high school and middle school English teacher. I often had kids coming into my classroom reading at a second or third grade level. So I am not here to tell you that reading doesn't matter. It matters immensely. But in not seeing the potential of active STEM learning moments in our schools, we're missing a huge opportunity to connect kids to meaningful ways to build a vocabulary, to communicate with other people, to be persuasive, to test out arguments and ideas, and to see how math actually gets used in real life. For me, this is deeply personal. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. We are proud parents in the public schools in San Francisco, and I am fully behind the work that our schools are doing. And yet I'm also very aware as a mom that there's a lot more that needs to happen to make sure that my kids get the holistic experience that they need to be ready for the future. For me as an educator, I'm always on a hunt with my kids for those little moments where I see the light of inquiry in their eyes, and I want to grab it. And I want to see how I can turn that into deep and active learning to make sure that they're getting the stimulation in their minds to be deeply, deeply ready for that next step in their lives. So I want to tell you a little story about my guy, Sam. You can see him up here with his Nerf crossbow. The end of his arrow, it has suction cups. If you live in San Francisco in our neighborhood, you have likely heard my husband and me yelling at him, please don't aim that at the television. Do not hit the, t the cat or your sister. And yet last week, for some reason, I had the presence of mind to think, gosh, there is so much STEM learning in this. 
There is math, thinking about angles and trajectory. There is physical science, there's engineering. How can I turn this into something building off of his natural in interest to help him see all of these great connections? So we set off on an exploration through our house to figure out what surfaces the suction cup best stuck to. <laughs> and after a lot of exploration, we discovered that the mirror on the back of my bedroom door does a darn good job holding the suction. We were able to count up to 20. I had to do a little math lesson with him that counting one, two, three, four, five, and counting one, two, three, four, five is not the same quantity, even though you're getting to five. So there's some really rich math learning in that. But then it gets to the real meat of it. As adults, oftentimes what we want to do is explain to our kids why this is happening. But I had, again, that presence of mind to say, OK, I'm going to turn this into a good question. Why do you think it's sticking to the mirror? He thinks about it for a second, and he says, it's a magnet. <laughs> OK. So how might we figure out if it actually is a magnet, if that's actually what's going on? Thinks for a second, his eyes light up. He runs out of the room, runs into his room, comes back, the magnetile. Oh, a magnetile, that's cool. He touches it to the mirror, and lo and behold, it drops to the ground. So I'm like, okay, so clearly it's not a magnet. So, sweetheart, how else could we figure out what it is? Maybe it's not because it's a magnet. No, mom, I think it's probably because it's a different kind of magnet. <laughs> yeah. I tell this story because it actually doesn't matter that he's wrong. That's not the point. The point is that in this process, he is going through some really deep cognitive processing. He is making connections between the toys that he's played with before and the toys that he's played with now. And all of this is laying the neurological groundwork for long-term STEM learning and thinking. And that's why I'm excited about it. At this point in the story, his sister comes in, and she's now hearing about magnets. She studied magnets a little bit in school. She's in second grade. And so she decides that they're going to go on a magnet scavenger hunt throughout our house and figure out every surface that is magnetized and is not. They discover that the oven, the side, is magnetized. The front is not. It all looks like stainless steel to me. But again, it doesn't matter that I don't have the answers for them. And so often, as parents, and even as teachers, we think that we are supposed to be the end-all and be-all of all knowledge. And it keeps us from encouraging our kids to explore things that we don't know how to navigate them through. It was an amazing and beautiful learning moment. And I share this because, again, as a parent and as an educator, I'm always on the hunt for these little tidbits that help us think about how to maximize our kids' learning. I want to shift now to thinking about engineering. If you are like me, when you hear the word engineer, you picture a white dude in a lab doing some sort of algorithmic something, something that's way beyond my math conceptualization. I'm the person who didn't do any highest level physical science because I didn't want to take calculus. And yet, Throughout our classrooms in this country right now, our teachers are being asked to teach engineering. Most teachers like me, when they think about an engineer, they have a very hard time connecting this image to the image of the four-year-old with the crossbow in the backyard. And yet, there is so much opportunity to make sense of these together. The National Academy of Engineering recognizes they have a branding problem. They know this. Truthfully, there's a whole position paper on it. They have talked about how they need to emphasize the creative aspects of engineering. They need to emphasize that engineering exists to solve world problems, to be able to attract in more women and people of color to the fields. They see this as critically important because the solutions we come up with are only as good as the experiences and perspectives of the people that are at the table to design them. So here at the museum, we know that teachers are going to be teaching engineering. We know that there is a branding problem in engineering. And we know that both girls and kids of color are not going into engineering. And that is doing all of us an enormous disservice. So over the next year, we are very excited to be launching a mobile engineering lab that's going to take hands-on active engineering into our communities all over the Bay Area and beyond. 
because we know that it's not just about fixing the branding issue, it's also about making sure that every child in our community has those early learning moments that are going to set them up for deep thinking. Take a little baby. You can see the inherent interest in building, in making, in cause and effect, trying to make sense of the world. How do we turn this intrinsic interest into a later and deeper engineering literacy? What are the moves that we as parents and educators need to make so that we're capitalizing on those moments of inquiry and turning them into deeper understanding? The first step for us really is to understand ourselves, what engineers do. And like many parents and many teachers, it's not something that I know a heck of a lot about. But as I've dug in and started to really learn this from an educator standpoint, I've come to see that it's actually pretty simple if we break it down in terms of the processes. Engineers see needs and problems in the community, and they figure out, through a very creative process, how to strategize new solutions to this. For engineers, as opposed to other fields, it's often in the form of technology. But they plan and they build models and they test it out. As a process, this is not all that different than what I do every night when I'm trying to make dinner. There's a need, there's some constraints that I have to work with, there's a process I have to go through, I'm going to brainstorm a few ideas, and I'm going to go with one, and halfway through the cooking process, it's not going to work the way I want, and so I'm going to redesign it a little bit. If we start seeing these links, and we start making them explicit to our kids, and actually talking about the engineering that is all around them, that is an, an enormous first step in what our kids are going to need. Taking that and thinking about when we're playing with our kids and we're doing physical play, very important for our kids to understand physics by doing physical play, we might put out a challenge to them. We might put out the need. Huh, how could you make that ball go really slowly down the ramp? When we're in nature, we might help them make connections between the natural world and the, the man-made world around us, and between different aspects of the natural world to help them to start to understand the connection between design and function. We might ask, what would happen if that falcon tried to land on the flower? What do you think the plane is built to do compared to a helicopter? How can you see the function as being similar and different and helping you to understand what's the engineering behind that? When our kids are doing any kind of three-dimensional building, this could be art-based or engineering-based, one of the really key things that we can do is just use what's called spatial talk. What's behind it? What's, behind, what's beneath it? What's around it? That kind of spatial talk is connected to kids' math understanding, but it's also connected to their engineering literacy, ultimately. For our school programs, a really key thing that we have found is that kids just want to dive in and start making. They want to start building things. But we need to teach them the process of pausing and reflecting and thinking, what is it you're going to make? Because then you can see if what you have made meets the need that you're trying to achieve. Any good preschool teacher can tell you one of the key things about enriching experiences in preschool is exposing children to all kinds of different new and novel materials. This is important for physics and for engineering too, because by touching and experiencing different materials, we are learning about the properties of different materials and how they vary. We also need to give our kids lots of tools to play with and to call them tools and technology. An egg beater is an example of technology. It is something that people have designed to solve a problem. We need to move away from just thinking about technology as being about computers. And we need to think about how we can use computers not just to search the internet and not just to do word processing, but instead to actually use as a tool for design and creation, which is why here on site we have launched the world's first early childhood fab lab, which is a high-tech makerspace for kids. Take things apart. Understand what's on the inside. Again, as parents and educators, it doesn't matter that we don't understand how it works. We don't have to be all sources of information to our kids, 
But what we can start to see in taking something apart is that it's a design. And someone, an engineer somewhere, has figured out how to put it together. My last piece of, of wisdom for you all is to remember that we need kids to operate in a 3D world for longer. So often, when we transition from preschool into elementary school, we move to handouts. But understanding physics, understanding engineering, and honestly, understanding mathematics is not best represented in a handout. It's best represented in three dimensions. And the more that we can get, let our kids live and breathe and work in three dimensions, the deeper their learning will be and the better prepared they will ultimately be to become engineers or at least to have deep under engineering literacy. Steve Jobs once commented that creativity is just connecting things. That's all it is. It's really simple. He explained, though, that some people are better at this than others either because they have more experiences or because they do a better job reflecting on their experiences to bring experiences together to new ideas. I ask you all to leave here today making a commitment to be stewards of your children's education so that they can do that connecting connecting to themselves, connecting to the natural and to the made world around them, and seeing all around them the engineering that has helped making the world a better place. Let's together make every child an engineer.